This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to online worship with United Presbyterian Church in Goldfield, Iowa. I am Pastor Sarah. Feels a little weird to be doing a pre-recorded service again, but with some COVID exposure this week and with the numbers up in our town and in our community, this felt like the safest way and a responsible means of controlling a pandemic that still continues, even though we have more hope with better treatments. Thank you for joining us for worship today. Before we move into a call to worship and a shortened service, I wanted to give just a couple announcements. We did have to postpone our Bible school this week out of an abundance of caution, not wanting Bible school to turn into some kind of a spreader event. We are still looking for a date that would work or trying to figure out how to reframe the use of those materials. At two o'clock on Tuesday, we'll have Bible study in the Rose Room. Anybody is welcome to join us. We just read a chapter of the Bible out loud and discuss it as we go through it. I don't think it's anything too intimidating. I think it's a good use of time and certainly fun to gather around the table and dive into scripture together. We have a couple other things on the calendar coming up and they are Facebook events. At least one is at this point, the other will be soon. The Iowa River Players, a, a local theater group in Rowan, Iowa, is performing the production, The Fantastics. It's a musical that some had mentioned they wanted to go see. Um, there are a few different days to be able to go and do that, but the date that has been picked for a church trip, if you want to go together with our church group or community group, the date we would be going would be August 12th. It's a Friday night, the show is at 7.30 in Rowan. If you are interested in that, please let me know and we can round up people and get tickets together. Tickets for the show are $15 a person. We may be able to work in some kind of a supper option before then. It kind of will depend on how many people want to go. Um, but if you would let me know if you're interested, that would be great. And then the last Sunday in August, so still a ways away, but start thinking about this, get it on your calendar. Uh, there is an Iowa Cubs game that Sunday afternoon. And a few of us thought it would be fun to take a church trip. Uh, that's something that this church used to do in the past, and we could do it again. If you are interested in going to the Iowa Cubs game, we can get a group rate if we have 25 people or more together for $6 a person. Now, if you live in Goldfield, we can carpool and travel together. If you don't live in Goldfield, but you want to meet up with us, there is no reason you can't get in on this too. Uh, the game starts that Sunday, I think around one o'clock. I figured if we left here at 1030 when church gets over, we could carpool, caravan down. We will have sack lunches provided if you want to take a sack lunch. Suggested donation of $6 to cover your ticket, uh, $6 per person. But again, we don't ever want cost to be prohibited. So with that or with the theater production, if you want to go but money's a little tight, we can find a way for you to go with us. For now though, let us come together for a time of worship. Come and worship. Be still and aware of God's presence within you and around you. Come and worship. Be still and aware of Jesus' presence within and around you. Come and worship. Be still and aware of the Holy Spirit's presence within and around you. Be still and know the presence of the triune God, the Father to whom we come, the Son through whom we come, the Spirit by whom we come. Hear his word. Be still and know that I am God.
to receive your word today. May we hear the words from the page from your holy scripture, but may we also hear the living word, your son Jesus, and may we boldly go where your spirit leads. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. We have two scripture readings before us today. The first comes from the Old Testament and ought to be fairly familiar if not from the words in scripture, but maybe from that timeless song by the birds. Let's listen to the words of Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 to 15. For everything there is a season, and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born, and a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to throw away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek and a time to lose, a time to keep, and a time to throw away. A time to tear, and a time to sow. A time to love, and a time to hate. A time for war, and a time for peace. What gain have workers from their toil? I have seen the business that God has given to everyone to be busy with. He has made everything suitable for its time. Moreover, he has put a sense of past and future in their minds, yet they cannot find out what God has done from beginning to the end. I know that there is nothing better for them than to be happy and enjoy themselves as long as they live. Moreover, it is God's gift 
that all should eat and drink and take pleasure in all their toil. I know that whatever God has done endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor nothing taken away. God has done this so that all should stand in awe before him. That which has already been, that which is to be already is. And God seeks out what has gone by. Our New Testament reading today is a story from the Gospel of Luke about two sisters who sort of have a sister rivalry here. There's a question of who is doing the better thing. It's the story of Mary and Martha. Perhaps it's one you, you know and have heard many times. This is Luke chapter 10, verses 38 to 42. Now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. Martha had a sister named Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she came to Jesus and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all of this work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha. You are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I found an article online, actually it was a slideshow, and somebody had taken time to crunch the numbers, maybe they had too much time on their hands, but they figured out approximately, in the average span of life, how much time people spent doing particular things. It was interesting, and I'm not offering this up as scientifically proven or accurate. I didn't take time to investigate where their sources came from. But for the sake of conversation, I wanted to share a couple of these findings with you. Within the average lifespan, a person spends approximately 26 years of their life sleeping. If you're wondering, the average person also spends about seven years of a lifetime awake trying to fall asleep. That might be more for some of us. Approximately three years of a life would be spent washing clothes. These experts guessed that 115 days of a lifetime are spent laughing. They said that's based on a figure of about six minutes a day of laughter. And they said back in the 1950s, an average amount of laughter during the day was 18 minutes. I don't know how they figure that out. I don't know if that is to be believed. But let's continue on with this math. 10.3 years working is an average based on 40 hours per week of work and retiring at a normal age. So I would say based on, on those numbers, it's probably more than 10 years per average life anymore. Five months of a life were spent complaining. That bothers me, 115 days laughing and five months complaining. But we don't know if these numbers are real. I do wonder though, what if we broke down an average lifespan or even a year of a life by mood? What would that pie chart look like if you saw a pie chart of the last decade of your life? What would the biggest piece of pie reveal? Is it happy? Is it sad? Is it apathetic? Is it eager? all of those emotions, all of those moods. And then what if we looked at that and looked at how much time was spent in different parts, different segments, different wedges of our life. Time is interesting, isn't it? We measure it by minutes, staring at the clock until the bell sounds, freeing you for recess or the end of a school day, waiting for the noon whistle, I don't know if people still use that as a guide for when it's time to go home for lunch. 
held up by a train? How many minutes has this been? You know, this is a state highway. They can't block it as long as it feels like they have. How much time is spent tapping a foot in the grocery store as you wait for the customer before you to unload their items onto the belt? Or as you wait for them to finish their argument with the cashier about how much that on-sale item should have rung up at? We measure hours with things like time sheets. We measure days, right? We measure months. I keep seeing pictures of babies laid out on one of those blankets where there's a circle around how many months old the baby is. You know, it's easier to take a picture of a one, two, three month old baby. By the time they get to be about four, five, six, seven months, I feel for the mom or the dad or, or the photographer trying to capture that moment of that child's life when that child is ready to crawl or race right off of that blanket. We measure time in years. It's been how many years since our loved one has passed? We've been at this job for this many years. How many years until retirement? How many years of marriage? You get it. Time is this mathematical way of trying to make sense out of our lives. We try to quantify where our time goes, how our time is spent, what our schedule should look like. What if we try to qualify it? What if we try to look at time not in increments, but a balcony view of what our time goes to or what it should go to? You know, as I preach this, as I think through these thoughts about time, again, I come back to a quote from Annie Dillard in The Writing Life. This isn't the first time I've used it, and it certainly won't be the last. It just is a quote that I need to hear again and again as I organize my life and time. And I think it's one that's benef beneficial for us to revisit. Annie Dillard writes, How we spend our days is, of course, how we spend our lives. What we do with this hour and that one is what we are doing. A schedule defends from chaos and whim. It is a net for catching days. It is a scaffolding on which a worker can stand and labor with both hands at sections of time. A schedule is a mock-up of reason and order, willed, faked, and so brought into being. It is a peace and a haven set into the wreck of time. It is a lifeboat on which you find yourself decades later still living. How we spend our days is how we spend our lives. Those tiny increments add up, don't they? And no matter where you are in your lifetime, in your average or above average lifespan, we know that minutes become hours, months, years, decades, a lifetime, a generation. I wonder how we can best be stewards of our lives. It is a stewardship question after all. You probably pay attention to where your money goes when the paycheck or your social security check or whatever investment you've made comes back, you have some idea of where that money is going to go. Is it going to go to rent or mortgage or groceries or other payments you need to make? We balance the checkbook or we check online to see what our balance is. What if we could pull up an account online? What if we had a register that showed withdrawals from the time we're given? What if it could show what's been deposited into the hours we have to the time we spend? The question, all of this to get to the question of the day, is this. What are you doing with your life? How are you spending what you've been given? Not your money, not your paycheck. But how are you using the days and the time and the life that God has blessed you with? If we had a register, a checkbook sort of thing, I wonder what items would you write down that deplete your soul energy? What things take time, take effort? What things go in the minus column? And then what adds to it? Are there things that give you more time? Um, certainly if stopping for a train can deplete time, maybe you get time back if your shift ends early, if an event is canceled. If you wake up a little bit earlier some morning or stay up a little bit later. You know, stewardship isn't just paying attention to finances. 
but it's also budgeting, scheduling, planning to use the time that we've been given. And that doesn't mean that if you set a schedule, you have to stick to it. Things come up, flexibility is key. There are always things on the horizon that we don't anticipate. But I think it's important to seek balance. I think we see that in Ecclesiastes. It's not always time to plant the crops, right? If I was still trying to plant tomato plants, I'm a little bit late this part of July. In the fall, it's time to tear some of those crops out of the ground. It's time for harvest. It's time to undo what we did a few months ago. There is that balance. There's a time for everything. Sometimes it's the beginning of a new life. It's getting that baby ready to lay out on the blanket to see how many months old it is. And sometimes it's a time to say goodbye. It's a time to wonder how many months, how many days or hours does this loved one have left? How can we make the most of the time that is left? There are times to weep and there are times to laugh, times to mourn, times to dance. I don't know how that shows up on the schedule or on a calendar. I don't know if those always end up balanced equally. I would hope for more joy and less mourning. But oftentimes we find ourselves having to do both at the same time. We seek that balance and we remember that Ecclesiastes passage, it's so tempting to stop when it gets to the, there's a time for war and a time for peace. But it's important to go on and to continue. Because it's important to remember that what workers gain from their toil matters far less than what God has already figured out. See, for us, time is a construct that helps control and regulate, helps us plan our lives. Time is an illusion for God. God is infinite in both directions. God isn't bound by days or hours or minutes or seconds. And God is well aware of what has happened, what is happening, and what will happen. And God is present in all of that. And it's that sense of time unfolding infinitely before God that Jesus points to when it comes to this conversation between Mary and Martha. Who is in the right? You know, the, the, the disciples and Jesus have come to visit. They are at Martha's house. Uh, the fact that a woman owns a house is remarkable in and of itself. Martha has welcomed these people into her house. And she is concerned about who's going to do the dishes, who's going to serve and prepare the food, who's going to do the housework, the hospitality piece of hosting people in your house. Her sister Mary, who should be helping according to custom and according to that sisterly bond, Mary's worthless. She's not helping at all. She's sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to him talk as though she's one of the disciples and there for the lesson and not for the hospitality piece of it. Martha has this outrage and she brings it to Jesus and Jesus gives perhaps the surprising answer. Mary has chosen correctly. She had a choice here. She could do the ordinary thing. She could help, she could be busy, she could be looking at that to-do list and crossing off items with her sister. But Mary has recognized that in this moment, they're not on human time, they're on God time. The Son of God is present in Mary's sister's house. Jesus has come to a visit. He's there in body. He's there teaching. He's there loving them. Why wouldn't you stop and soak all of that up while you could? Jesus points to that. Mary has chosen the better part, and that won't be taken away from her. Are we Mary or are we Martha? Do we get caught up with this list of what needs to be done? Are we able to set aside the busy, set aside the stuff that God has given human beings to be busy with? Can we set that aside long enough to sit in the presence of God? If we can't, we're doing it wrong. If you look at the calendar of your life and almost every moment that you're awake has written in it some obligation, something you're supposed to do, some task, something that is keeping you busy, you're doing it wrong. There's a commandment about that. 
We're supposed to keep a Sabbath. We're supposed to have time in our schedule, in our routine, to rest. If we don't take time to rest, our body will demand time to rest. It will catch up with us. And it might not happen at a convenient time. Maybe you're down with an illness for a week and a week that you had all kinds of things planned at work and at home. Maybe it catches up with you when years after faithfully working your job and overtime, your body just tells you, I can't keep going the way I've had to go for decades. Our body keeps score. Our body knows how hard we work. And we need that rest. We need time to sit. The Hebrew word for that is Sabbath. It means to sit. And I hope that you're finding time to sit in the presence of God and find rest. I hope you're finding time for peace, for quiet. There's a tendency to rush and fit in as much as we can. And there are days that we just need to stop and let ourselves sit at the feet of Jesus and savor time outside of the constraints that we have in our time. Rest is needed. As I've thought through these scriptures this week, I keep have, having song lyrics drift in my head. Does that happen to you? Sometimes it's a hymn, sometimes it's a refrain from a praise song. For me, it's been a Mumford and Sons song. Uh, the words are, are this, I'm not gonna sing to you because it would be copyright violation if they could even figure out that I was singing the song based on my pitch, they probably wouldn't know. But anyway, the lyrics to the song go like this. In these bodies we will live, in these bodies we will die, and where you invest your love, you invest your life. Think about where you want to invest your love. Think about the time you've been given and how you've used it so far, how you intend to use it, how you can make the most out of the love that Christ has given you to share. Let's invest that. Let's think of that as a gift of stewardship. Let's spend our lives doing what is most important. And let's choose what's most important, not by the world standards, but by the standards of Jesus, who tells Martha, you have a lot of things on your mind, and Mary has one thing on her mind. Let's be like Mary. Let's seek Jesus. Let's listen to those lessons. And then let's put them into practice with however many days and hours and years we have left. Where you invest your love, you invest your life. The name of that song is Awake My Soul. And I pray that your soul would be wide awake today. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Let us pray, and then we'll close with a song for our benediction. Loving God, you have given us such glorious lives. There are highs, there are lows. Just as Ecclesiastes told us, there is a time for everything, and sometimes it does feel like it's happening all at once. We pray, God, that you would be with us in each moment. And we pray that even as we rush around too much at times, we pray that you would let us sit next to you, that you would sit as a living presence in our lives, that you would guide us and be with us through the ups and downs, through every stage and with every generation. We pray today, God, for those in need of your healing touch, whether it be a physical illness or a mental illness, or something else going on in our lives, we ask that you would bring healing. May you continue to be with doctors and nurses and all kinds of medical uh, professionals as they go about their days. May you give them the wisdom they need to diagnose and treat various illnesses that they come across. We pray for those in public service. We think especially of police officers and fire departments and city officials. We pray, God, that you would be with them and make them wise and able to seek justice and do things uh, with integrity. Give them strength and encouragement to go about their days. We pray, Lord, for those in our military in the various branches of service. We pray that you would be with them as they go through training and different exercises remind people that they are not alone no matter what country they're in or how far off the grid they may be. God, we can go nowhere that you can't find us and you are always waiting, ready, eager to bring us home. We pray, God, that you would continue to guide us, that you would continue to bless this church. We pray for the Methodist congregation here in Goldfield as they welcome in a new preacher today. We pray that you would be with Pastor Allaire as she begins her ministry to Goldfield. And we pray, God, for churches around the country that you would keep them strong, help them faithfully bear your name. May the light of Christ reach every corner of the world. Until Jesus returns, as Jesus promises to come back, we will boldly pray as your children. Amen. Be the Lord.